Um, you mentioned the fact that Peter is telling others to shepherd the flock. Correct, because he's the supreme bishop, but there are other bishops in the church. Each bishop has to rule his diocese, okay? That uh, was, in fact, particularly important in the early church when the means of communication and travel were obviously not what they are today. And so there was more of a reliance on the authority of the bishops in their specific localities. It's not like today where, you know, if you had a real pope, you could he could communicate with the whole world instantly. It's much more difficult. And so there was more of an emphasis on the shepherding of the flock of the lower pastors in their specific areas. And we see that in the Acts of the Early Church as well. That doesn't negate that there is one supreme bishop the supreme shepherd. And as far as the fact that he describes himself as an elder or a shepherd among shepherds, well, Jesus himself says in Matthew twenty twenty seven, let he who is chief among you be as he who doth serve. Okay, so he says that he who is chief, and we already know the same gospel told us that Peter is the chief, has to conduct himself with humility. He has to uh, be a, a servant, and that's one reason why the popes are called servant of the servants of God. That he's not going to necessarily parade it around all the time. That it's just like if you had the commissioner of a league saying, "I am also a fellow sports fan." That doesn't mean that he's not the commissioner of the league. And so the fact that he's saying, "I am also a shepherd," he is the chief shepherd, and he's telling them how to shepherd. And in fact, in First Peter chapter five, he gives them specific. 5.2, he gives them specific instructions on how to do that. He says, feed the flock, taking the oversight thereof, how to do it, not by constraint, but willingly, okay, but of a ready mind. So he's instructing the shepherds. Um, and you mentioned, well, I think that responds to some of the different things you brought up. Uh, you were going to say? Um, yeah, the, uh, as far as them being the uh, uh, it is true that the popes have a tendency to speak with a certain humility, but they never leave it. Somebody somewhere always says, this is our head guy, this is our chief guy. You mentioned that Paul uh, went up to meet Peter. First of all, he's appointed, admittedly, he's appointed by Christ himself, but he goes up three years later to meet Peter, stays with him some days, yes, then, uh, he learns from him. Yeah, then 14 years after, he goes up to Jerusalem again with Barnabas and took Titus. Um, and in Galatians 2, 7, he says, When they saw that the gospel of the uncircumcision was committed unto me, as the gospel of the circumcision was unto Peter, and he goes on from there, And when James, Cephas, and John, who seemed to be pillars, it seems like 17 years he's been in ministry now, and he can't even identify the Pope. If you went to, I mean, let's say there were a real Pope. If you went to Vatican City 55 years ago or whatever and uh, met some of the leading you know, prelates there or whatever, would you come away and say, uh, and Pius, who seemed to be, a, a, a name a bunch of other guys and say, seem to be pillars, there is n he is not just one of the crowd. In fact, I think I, um, some uh, latter-day Catholic apologists have a tendency to talk about the Pope is not a Lone Ranger. He works only with the College of Bishops, but I believe you and some of the Popes have taught against what you call collegiality, that he's not just one of the crowd. He does rule by himself without the consent of the governed, so he's totally unique in his own way. There's no lumping him in with the other uh, leaders. He does stand alone, and nobody seems to identify him unless you read into this passage here and there. Nobody seems to identify him. Even Paul, after 17 years, he doesn't bother to even mention. He just calls him a pillar, and certainly he is a pillar, along with James. And James. Right, exactly. So, so the fact that he says he seems to be pillars, you're implying that you know, they only seem to be pillars. Well, you admit that they are pillars. Okay. Well, yeah. And in fact, if you believe that is St. Peter in Galatians 2.11, whom he resists to his face for this uh -huh. error of conversation, not of doctrine, then you'd have to admit that he's making a big deal out of this. He withstood him to the face. One could argue that that implies that it's a big deal because he's withstanding a superior. Furthermore, he says that these same people, quote, gave him the right hand of fellowship and instructed him to go to the Gentiles and told him to be mindful of the poor, which he was, quote, careful to do. And so he was careful to follow what these people who gave him the hand of fellowship 
instructed him. Furthermore, even though St. Paul is the apostle of the Gentiles, because his field of activity was primarily confined and incredible in that arena, he himself, when there's a question about what the Gentiles have to do, he doesn't consult scripture. He doesn't say, well, I'm going to pray to Jesus who will enlighten me. No, he goes to Jerusalem. And he says this in uh, Galatians 2, 1 to 2. And he says, I went again to Jerusalem, lest by any means I should run or had run in vain. And so St. Paul okay, is saying that he went to Jerusalem to check with the apostles to make sure that he wasn't running in vain. In other words, you know, incorrect about this. So he was submitting, deferring to their judgment. Well, Paul was always mindful of his uh, position. Um, uh, Paul was always mindful of his position as the uh, the least of all the apostles and uh, not worthy to be called an apostle because he persecuted the church and one born out of time and all this stuff. So he knows the others were, they knew Christ personally, they were his disciples, they walked with him, and um, that he, you know, would compa- uh, check things with them. However, he acts boldly and definitively and teaches a lot of doctrine, a great deal more than, than Peter. In fact, most of our understanding of the end times and, and the Antichrist and everything we have comes from Paul. Now, in spite of Paul's belief in himself as the uh, as not worthy to be an apostle, he does say in 2 Corinthians 11 and 12, I suppose I was not a whit behind the very cheapest apostles. And in 12 he says... Uh, uh, for I, in nothing am I behind the very cheapest apostles, though I be nothing. So he does not seem to think there's anybody in the pecking order above him. Um, well, he's saying that he, like he also says, I labored more abundantly than all of them, because he's the greatest missionary in church history. That's that's true. Okay, but that, you know, um, for instance, Father de Smit, who was the apostle to the Rocky Mountains in the 19th century, he was a greater missionary than Pope Gregory XVI. But that doesn't mean he was the Pope. He labored more abundantly than Pope Gregory the Sixteenth did. And so the fact that he labored more abundantly than the other apostles doesn't mean he's above them. And we clearly see him deferring to them on a question dealing with the Gentiles. Okay, and he's the apostle to the Gentiles. So he doesn't decide it. No, he goes to the apostles at Jerusalem. Can you hold on one sec? Sure. Sorry about that. You can go ahead. If you... Yeah, I have no doubt that I don't deny at all that he went to the apostles. I just don't see any evidence that it was Peter himself, all the apostles, because they were senior in a way to him, because they were apostles first. But the the primacy, well, I don't believe the scripture teaches anywhere the necessity, and, and I would be hard-pressed to, uh, I'd be very interested if anybody could provide a reference to this, any necessity to be subject to the, uh, the Pope, as uh, Barnabas VIII said, uh, it is absolutely necessary, and this is an ex-Cathedra statement, obviously. We declare, say, define, and pronounce it. It doesn't get more ex-Cathedra than that. It is absolutely necessary for the salvation of every human creature to be subject to the Roman pontiff. Now, do you believe Peter had the same understanding of the papacy that Boniface VIII had? Yeah. And okay, and so, see so what he, that means? Uh-huh. Uh, unless you want to continue, I could explain. I say, so Peter actually believed that uh, unless people were subject to him, uh, that uh, they would not be saved. He believed that unless you were subject to the authority of the church itself, which he was the head of, you can't be saved. And that's what it means, that you must be incorporated into the church, which has a hierarchy, okay, and which has authority. And that if you reject that authority, as we read in Matthew eighteen seventeen, you are to be considered as the heathen and the publican. We also read in Acts 4.12 that there's no salvation um, except through the name of Christ and that the Lord added daily to to their society. He added daily to their society or church those who were to be saved. And so there's a visible church moving along here. It presides at the Council of Jerusalem. Okay, it issues the instructions that Paul carries back and implements. Okay, this is a visible church which you must be part of. Okay, you must be added to this society if you are going to be saved. Well, certainly one must be part of the church to be uh, in Christ to be saved. But you know, it's it's unthinkable to me that 17 years after... Now, uh, just for the benefit of any listeners who might not know, and correct me if I have this wrong, because there's so much, Catholic doctrine is so 
vast and complicated that you know uh, I might have a detail or two wrong. I've been corrected on a number of things by reading your uh, your materials. Um, the uh, the promise in the the promise to Peter that he would be the leader and be the basically the first pope was given to him in, uh, in Matthew 16 and everything, but it was actually fulfilled after the resurrection at the uh, the breakfast on the, the shore of the Sea of Galilee, right? Correct. He he, he was entrusted. Yeah, he took. He was given and entrusted the authority fully okay. by Jesus. 